Welcome to 101. I'm Greg Bassey, your host from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper. We're back to masking in tight spaces here at Salisbury University. So we're with our good friend, Dr. Donna Hanlon today by Zoom. Welcome, Dr. Hanlon. Thank you, Greg. Nice to be here. So we have you on every September 1st to talk about what's about to happen uh, with the schools reopening. So you want to give me a rundown? Well, we're all very excited about schools opening for the fall, five days a week, with um, the vast majority of our students being uh, returning in person um, and our teachers returning in person. Everyone's very excited about it. So certainly some excitement here leading up to it. We, we thought just a few months ago that we would be able to have a normal interview and that things would be back to normal, but we've been kind of caught in this new um, surge of coronavirus. The Delta variant has certainly um, knocked us for a loop again. Um, we were hoping that we would be fairly close to uh, normal operations, but um, we're having to keep a very close eye on the spread. And because of um, the level of community transmission, we determined in Wicomico County that we would be masking um, as part of a, a a multi-layered approach to um, making sure that our schools were able to stay open and that we're protecting our students and our staff in the best way that we could. But then the State Board of Education swooped in because there were some uh, different decisions being made and they weren't always based perhaps on science the same way that you were trying to make your decision. And now there's going to be masking in all the public schools across the state. That's correct. We're still waiting for the final step in that process, and that's a legislative review that happens early in September. Um, but we are all anticipating that the emergency regulation put in place by the state board will take effect um, right around the 14th of September. But we will continue with our masking as we had planned. Um, I interviewed Steve Leonard last week, uh, who's the president and CEO of Title Health. You know, he didn't feel like he had the medical expertise, even for him, the guy who was in charge of the healthcare system, you know, to make a determination about what to do. But he did say that your decision to mask was probably the right one, especially for this county, because if an infection got in a classroom, it wouldn't obliterate everyone in the classroom. It would just affect the kids that were directly involved. That's correct. And that, to me, Although I was pretty confident in the decision that um, I had made in order to keep the schools open and students and staff safe when that guidance changed in the first part of August that said that if everyone is masked and a student is positive, then the students, other students who are masked, who are um, within three to six feet, are, not, are no longer considered close contacts, and so they don't have to quarantine unless they are positive, unless they are symptomatic, and then they obviously would get tested as well. And that's going to allow us to keep students in school, which is what our mission is, to educate our students face-to-face um, -face with our teachers. So, um, I, yeah, I, I haven't for a moment question the decision that we've made here locally. I think it was the right thing to do. Nobody wants to wear a mask. We all can't wait for the day that we don't have to wear a mask. But I believe for now, in order to try to return to some semblance of normalcy, that is five days a week and keeping our schools open, it's what we have to do. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Leonard complained about, not complained about, observed, is that he has a problem with getting his employees vaccinated. Um, a lot of them are waiting for the, uh, the FDA approval, uh, which now has come for the Pfizer vaccine. What's the situation in the county school system? Is there a problem with getting your employees vaccinated? Well, we want our employees um, to be vaccinated. There isn't a requirement at this point, but we do hope that all of our employees get vaccinated. We understand that there's going to be various reasons why either um, individuals don't want to be or can't be for medical reasons, perhaps. Um, but we are, um, we're currently in the process right now of getting an accurate uh, percentage of our staff, our school staff, who have been vaccinated. And that's for two reasons. We um, First of all, our, it, would, it will help our nursing staff tremendously to know 
to have that information when we have to make a determination about isolation or quarantine. But also the Maryland State Department of Education in in reviewing all of the factors um, in even making the masking decision wants that data from us. So art nurses are collecting that information confidentially from all staff members, and then it's being turned into us at the central office just in terms of a data point. So we'll be able to tell you the exact percentage. Last year, we thought that it was 85% or so, 88%, um, but that was based upon a survey and we extrapolated results based upon those those individuals who responded to the survey. So um, we now are attempting to get an accurate count and we will within the next few days. One of the things that's been so distressing in watching the national news, and you see these uh, videos all the time of uh, school board meetings in which different parents are coming and yelling at the school board members about the masking policies. We haven't had such a, a visual display of that here locally that I have seen at least, but you must be hearing something similar behind the scenes. Well, yes, I have received interesting after we made the decision or I, I announced the decision at the August board meeting, um, the initial response almost immediately were many emails of thanks many emails, parents saying, we're, we're crying tears of relief. Thank you for protecting our students and our staff. Um, then slowly I did begin to get some, um, some opposite views on that. Um, and my, I have always prided myself in responding. I attempt to respond to all parents within 24 hours. And I, uh, attempt to provide factual information. This is why we made this decision. I am not a scientist, as you said earlier, or, or a medical doctor either. That's why I rely on the expertise of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC and other organizations that are, are medical experts and have studied the research and attempt in my communication with those individuals to present the facts and this is the reason. In some cases, I get a thanks very much for clarifying that for us. Um, and in other cases, I get a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of questions about the safety of masks for students. And I would, um, in those cases, send some uh, information from the American Academy of Pediatrics that shows that it is, it is safe for the majority of our students, majority of children ages two and up. Um, there's this question about um, CO2 levels being, you know, kept in the mask and how that's not good for students and that's not accurate. Those CO2 um, molecules are so small, they do go through the mask and they're not retained. But interestingly, there had been a study that was published um, in July and shortly after it was published, it was retracted by the journal. I'm trying to remember what met, it was a medical journal. They retracted it because they recognized that it was, that the methodology for the study was flawed. But there are some individuals who saw that and just believe that to be the case. So to answer your question, I attempt to communicate. And when I recognize that um, no matter what I present, there are strong views, strong emotions behind this. I, you know, I allow those views to just remain. As I said to one parent, we're going to have to agree to disagree. You know, we've just spent 10 or 12 minutes of our interview talking not about education at all. So um, I'm sure that's, you know, what your workflow is like a lot these days. And my paper this week in Solar Independent, I've got two guest columns from uh, Martin Hutchison and Grace uh, Murdoch-Foxwell about uh, trying to en uh, encourage us to support our teachers and the morale of teachers. They're very concerned that teachers are pretty tired of all this. Um, what are you seeing out there with the teachers? I think that's the case. I think that especially at the end of last year, um, teachers were ready for a break. We were concerned about getting enough staff to be able to help us with summer programs, which were so important, especially this year. We did end up getting enough, but there were a lot of teachers who just 
needed a break, some downtime away from everything we went through last year. And everybody was so hopeful to begin in a pretty normal organizational structure this year. And as we've already been talking about, that's just not happening totally um, because of the masking and the cleaning and, the, and, and everything else that we're having to continue to do. But I think, and you know, I can't speak for every individual teacher. I think that morale is good. I think teachers are excited about coming back and being face to face with their students. And I can't wait to be in the schools on the first day of school and see that um, see that interaction between staff and students. That that excites me too. I just got so frustrated socially when I was around people, and they would say, "Well, these teachers want to do virtual learning. They don't want to be in the classroom. They're lazy. They want to stay home." And I would say that doesn't reflect anything that I see when I'm around teachers in terms of what they want to do in terms of their career and educating our children. I it was just a, a bad perception. Did you experience that as well? Um, I heard it, but certainly I did not witness it at right. all. In fact, t- teachers want to be back. We have a virtual program this year for a very, very small percentage of students who were successful last year and for a variety of reasons chose to remain virtual this year. The vast majority, more than the vast majority of our teachers chose, they did not want to be the virtual teachers. They want to be back face to face with their students. And I think if if anything, they worked as hard, if not harder, because of what they were required to do, teaching in a um, concurrent mode where they're teaching half of their students online and half of their students in the classroom. That was something none of us ever imagined that we'd have to do. And they did it. And some obviously were much more comfortable than others with with doing that, Um, but they did it and, um, and worked very hard at doing it. So I would say that there's absolutely no truth to teachers wanting to be virtual because it was easier. Yeah, I, I just never, I never understood the argument. It, just, it made no sense to me. Do you think there was a learning gap last year? Do you think maybe the uh, the level of learning declined somewhat? Do you think you're gonna have to catch up with that this year? I, I think so. I mean, I think that's, you know, I would expect that to be the case. Um, and we're, we'll be doing a lot of assessment Um, formative and summative, I'm sorry to use educational jargon there, but trying to learn where students are um, as they return to school this year so that we can take them where they are and accelerate their learning so we can catch those students up on any gaps that they may have as a result of um, any kind of um, difficulties that they had last year um, with technology, with um, just any kind of access, that's, I think it, I would be naive to think that 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 didn't happen, so. As you know, I love talking about infrastructure um, and every day I drive by Beaver Run and gosh, that is looking so nice there. It's beautiful. It's it's so exciting. I was there a few weeks ago and saw saw the building out back and um, we're we're on schedule. We are anticipating that our administrative staff will be able to move back into the new or to move into the new building uh, in uh, June of next year. And then in the fall, a year from now that students would, um, that will open school in the new building. So very, very exciting. What are the other school construction projects that are in the pipeline now? So the, the, the main other project is Mardella Middle and High School, and that is going according to plan as well. We're in the uh, design development phase of um, making sure everything's ready for construction. And um, I think we have a couple of processes to go through, including the School Building Commission and the Board of Ed um, with reviewing and approving those design development documents, but then, um, pending funding and everyone seems to be committed between our local government and the state government. Um, But, you know, pending that coming to fruition, we're very hopeful that um, we'll have a, um, we'll be able to begin construction in the first quarter of 23, I believe it is. So I know the Mardella community is very excited about that. 
Very excited. And of course, there's going to be some more politics about the funding as we go on. But I yes. think there's enough positiveness around it that it could work out. Absolutely. Yep. There's And then there's some roofing projects and others. Um, we're looking um, in the future, not, not immediately, but one of our projects now is looking at um, Fruitland Primary um, and looking at what, what the needs there are there, um, but that's a couple of years out. Um, I'm always uh, amazed, too, um, at how students uh, seem to need the athletic uh, competition that goes on and how much they were looking forward to the fall sports this year, having things more routine. Um, how are things with that? Um, we're, we're in the midst of practices, and I believe our first games start shortly. Sorry, can't rattle the dates off for you. Um, but yes, we are practicing. We're um, monitoring students and any kind of COVID um, symptoms or positive cases and following all of the uh, guidance for isolation and quarantine, because as you probably know, that when students are exerting themselves, they're not masking. Um, and so we're, we're keeping a very close eye on that in hopes that um, we'll be able to continue with that important important aspect of schooling. Any clarity that you can give us on what's happening with Kerwin and when things might start to take effect? Sure. I've actually been reviewing that very closely recently because the Accountability Implementation Nominating Committee, which is a state committee that will nominate members to the Accountability Implementation Board, that's all starting up and that organization will be responsible for creating the structure for the plans for local school systems on how we're gonna implement Kerwin. And um, so, so all that is, uh, I was just reviewing a timeline. One of the things that we had to do um, that all local school systems in conjunction with their local governments had to appoint um, an implementation coordinator or someone who would have that responsibility. Um, we have assigned that responsibility currently to Dr. Stauffer um, because a lot of what we do with the county around Kerwin has to do with funding, as you've already said, and as the chief finance officer, um, he is very integrally involved in that. So it is all starting up. We're again, looking at what are those key dates? We've, we've taken care of that uh, requirement to to assign the coordinator. I believe Dr. Stauffer attended his first meeting of all of the county implementation coordinators so that we can map out a, a blueprint, if you will, for the blueprint to make sure that we are accomplishing everything in the timeliness that is required and that we know the elements that must go into the plan. It's very, very complex with all of the recommendations that come down through the law. Um, in those five areas that came from the Kerwin Commission. So it's, it's ramping up and um, we will be talking about it more and more. I see that as a topic monthly when we meet with the county executive and quarterly when we meet with our county government, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page with what that funding will look like and, um, and the other requirements, the policy requirements by local school systems. I watch those encounters, those quarterly encounters very closely that you have with, with the county council. Um, and I'm, I'm always stunned that how, how people in the county and even on the council to, to a degree don't understand how the funding system works. Uh, they think that the county funds the entire school board budget. That's not true. Um, as, as much as I do to try to explain how things work, even with Kerwin, you know, there's a lot of money coming from the state um, you know, the responsibility of the county is is really not that significant, I don't think. I, I agree with you. And that's a hard thing to get um, the community to understand. Um, I think that there will be an increased requirement by the county through um, the legislation of the Kerwin Commission, but we're still trying to figure out exactly what that is. Um, uh, I know one of the topics that we're going to be talking with the county executive about later this week is um, what does maintenance of effort look like moving forward? As you know, it changed through the legislation to a three-year average rather than just one year. And they determined last year that it wouldn't include the 2020-21 school year because of enrollment counts that were so volatile. So um, 
big topic, big topic, and we'll just continue to talk about it in hopes of getting more and more um, individuals, both on the council and in the community, to understand. Yeah, people routinely cite that 1970 statistic that 60% of the county general fund goes to education. And if you take out the library in Warwick, it's in the low 40s, if anything. Um, so you right. could argue that that we really do underfund public education based on a percentage of the county general fund. Yes, that's and that's another one of those facts that's hard to get others to understand because it seems that every year that presentation comes out from the county and it does cite that statistic, which does include other entities besides the school system. The pandemic has uh, really affected your uh, your three big initiatives that you've had in terms of your strategic planning, in terms of recruiting, uh, maintaining your staff, paying them better, uh, the pre-kindergarten aspects. How does this feel for you to not, you know, to be so stuck in an operational environment and not be able to look, you know, to the broad things that you want to try to accomplish with the school system? Yeah. Well, um, it, it's frustrating. Um, it's, but I, um, in fact, just last week when I spoke to the leadership team, all of the administrators in the county, I talked about um, how the last thing that we want to do is return to normal. We want to take what we've learned from the pandemic and become better. And then I reviewed our strategic plan and those now four strategic priorities, including um, improving um, school climate with in terms of student behavior um, and and talked about how for the next iteration of achieve which will be believe it or not achieve 6.0 will um, will include hopefully some innovative strategies so we're we're starting or I, I have been all along not to the degree that I wanted to but I'm going to be pushing our administrative team to look at, okay, what's next? What can we do to push those four priorities forward? The Kerwin Commission, including um, the recommendation to expand pre-kindergarten certainly is very helpful. And the funding that will come with that will be helpful in, in terms of helping us with that. And some of the other college and career ready initiatives that are coming through um, the blueprint or other, otherwise known as Kerwin will also help. There's a lot of things that are aligned between the blueprint for Maryland's future and our strategic plan. Quite a bit of overlap. So um, we'll continue to be looking at that alignment and making sure that, um, that we're not operating from two different, um, you know, two different game plans. We will align them. I, I have to say, I just I admire how flexible the school system has been and how the volunteers have stepped up and also your um, your, your church supporters. Um, I, I don't think I ever realized how many kids the school system basically is responsible for feeding each day. So when schools were closed, there had to be other things that other people had to step forward and still continue to provide lunches and food for kids. Uh, and that seems to have continued. It's amazing how much support you have gotten from people in the community to help keep things going. Yes, well, you you mentioned Martin Hutchinson and Grace Murdoch, and they're just a, a couple of very active uh, supporters of our school system, but there are many others out there. All of our schools have faith-based partners and they've been wonderful throughout this whole thing. But our food service team, as you've mentioned, um, did a yeoman's job of being on the curb, <laughs> you know, um, providing meals to students and families throughout the whole thing. And then this summer that continued, not at every school, but in locations throughout the community. Um, we'll see what fall brings as long as we are in school, we know, we know that we're going to be able to um, provide meals for students in school. Um, so we're, we're determined that we're going to remain that way, making sure that our students have the support that they need. But there are people certainly in the county who don't receive that information directly from you. So tell me what you would like to say to the family members, the grandparents, uh, the people in the business community about what's going on in the school system and, and what you'd like to see happen this year. How can we support you? 
Well, the first thing I would say is thank you. <laughs> thank you to all, uh, you know, as you said, I do reach parents, but grandparents and, and other community members who through their churches and other um, organizations have supported our students through tutoring, through hotspots, through uh, you name it. Um, the support has been tremendous. And I, I'm hopeful that although you did cite, you know, some individuals talking about how teachers had it easier. I do think that parents and others, for the most part, recognize just how hard teachers do work. So I would say just continuing to support our teachers. And when you're in conversations in the community where you hear something like that, please, you know, provide um, some balance to that conversation by um, reminding people how hard our teachers work. And Get involved in, in the organizations that are partners with our schools to come in and, and support our students through tutoring, through, you know, the United Way has the Women's United Way that reads with our students. And just there's so many different ways to get involved with our schools. And um, the more we can engage in the community, the better our schools will be. And one of the things you were doing such a great job better than anyone I've ever seen is reaching out to the business community. And they were great advocates for the idea that we need a trained populace um, to make ourselves economically competitive. But, you know, I, you were just making such great progress with the Wicomico County Education Foundation, um, identifying problems, figuring out a way to fund them. I, I just can't wait for that to return. And, and I see that happening. I, I think that you're going to see... Um, an increased presence of, um, you know, to see what we're doing in partnership with, you know, the Education Foundation, the Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Salisbury Committee, and all kinds of um, partners, especially with business partners, um, because that, again, they're part of the community and part of um, helping people understand the economic impact that the, that the school system has in the community. Okay, where would you like to send people online to find out more about what's going on with the schools and how can people contact you if they want to? Well, um, probably going through our website is um, answers the first part of the question, um, www.wcboe.org. And um, there's lots of information about um, you know, coronavirus strategies. There's even a link to the transmission rate now in the community on the spread. People can c communicate with me through email. That's dhanlon at wcboe.org um, or, you know, calling my office. Um, and um, you're going to get Andrea, who is um, my wonderful right hand, but she will put you in touch with me or with someone who can answer questions. So, um, and then uh, open door sessions will begin again in October. So, I'm available to answer questions as needed and um, just really appreciate your support and the support of the community as we've gotten through these last 18 months and we continue to forge ahead. Well, Dr. Allen, thanks so much for taking time to do this at your busiest time of year and uh, good luck as you begin this semester. Gosh, what, what a trying time we live in. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that and we're, we're looking forward to good times ahead. I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper, another edition of 101 right here on PAC-14. First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and 
Let's make a difference.